Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Rimi Longway, uh, Head of Department of Political Science, Textile College. Your moderator for today's very important, you know, Texel College Dot Talks webinar series on Indo Naga dilemma and unbiased historical and contemporary view with Sir Kohoto Chisi Sumi, a renowned social activist in Naga society today. Well, uh, before I have the honor to welcome and introduce our honorable speaker, I would like to inform and request all the participants to kindly mute microphones and refrain from presenting the screen. However, one can use the chat box uh, for putting forward relevant questions to be taken up during the Q&A session later. I also would like to inform all the participants that towards the end of the session, uh, I will be sharing the feedback link, uh, which will have to be, you know, uh, filled up by all the participants in a few minutes time. So uh, without further ado now, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce our Honorable Speaker, about the speaker, our Honorable Speaker, Sir Koto Chisi Sumi is the hereditary chief of the village, Sumi village of Hevisi in Dimapu district. School at St. Edmund School, Silong, he is a graduate of Hazal Ali College, Mokokchong, a well-read person he hails from one of the most prominent families of the Sumi tribe of Nagaland, deriving a direct lineage to the legendary Chukha Chisi, chief of the Sichimi village. His great grandfather, Kutu Chisi, established the village of Lokobo approximately 160 years ago. It was his grandfather, Sikipu Sema, who risked British displeasure and the condemnations of his fellow chiefs to grant the American missionary, Mr. Bank Iver Anderson, permission to open the first Christian center in Sumi territory at Aizuto. His father, Mr. Nibuku Sema, settled at Mukokchung village, uh, town and was one of its most prominent citizens. He was instrumental in the founding of Town Higher Secondary School, one of the first private English school in Nagaland, Fazal Ali College, the first arts college in Nagaland, Sumi M.E. School, now Sumi High School, and Nibuku High School, the first schools ever set up by a tribal community in Nagaland. Drawing from familiar familiarity, his elder brother, Mr. Inato Chisi, being a repository of knowledge of these issues with nearly all the prominent players, both overground and underground, in the Naga issue, from colonial time, colonial times to post-independent to statehood. The speaker's credential to discuss another issue is as good, if not better, than that of any other Naga. Now, as you all know, the Naga issue described as one of the world's, you know, oldest surviving uh, insurgency uh, problem. But for us, we, ours, ours is not a, uh, the issue of insurgency. Uh, in reality, uh, uh, we have, you know, something which uh, we deserve to get. We are asking something that we deserve to get. There are very many aspects of a Naga, you know, uh, movement. And uh, we are very, you know, privileged today to have uh, Sir Kuhoto Sisi, you know, a renowned social activist and who has, whose credential to talk about this issue, you know, no, uh, is is uh, you know uh, no wonder that uh, better much more better than anyone else in another society today. 
So without further ado, I would like to you know welcome uh, uh, everyone. Please join me welcome Sir Uto Sisumi, our honourable speaker for our session today, Sir. Thank you, Dr. Lomai, and uh, good evening to all the viewers. The topic which I am addressing is a very, it has multiple threads. Although our history, Naga history, is not that uh, long, there have been so many players and so many threads to the story that it is very confusing. And amidst the confusion, it is very unfortunate that many lies have cropped up. Now, my purpose, initial purpose, was to address the contemporary realities that we are facing today. But when we confuse the present by raking up the past and by manufacturing or superimposing different stories, then it creates more confusion and we lose direction. So my intent, I, I don't know if I'll be able to cover all that I wish to do, but my intent is to clear up confusions of the past and try to address where we are heading. So what we have to keep in mind is that we Nagas, we lived untouched and unknown by people until the advent of the British. Now, prior to the arrival of the British, every Naga village was an independent, self-governing, self-sustaining unit. Some villages may have owed fealty or suzerainty to larger villages. They might have paid uh, annual tributes, but those were exceptions to the rule. And even in such cases, the village unit itself was independent in every other way. Now, after the arrival of the British, the first major event that the Nagas faced was the demand for the lab labor during the First World War. So now, the British raised a uh, number of labor corps across India, but in the Naga Hills, the 21st Naga Labor Corps was raised. Now this Labor Corps consisted of uh, 1,000 Sunnis, uh, 400 Lothas, 200 Owls, 200 Rengmas, and 200 Changs and Trans Border Tribes. Trans Border means the unadministered parts, what we presently know as a uh, Kwingsang, Mon, Kifri, and all those districts. And this group was led by uh, Mr. Kuhoi Jimomi, the chief of Sky Village, with the assistance of uh, Mr. Hekeke Awomi of Sirimi Village. Now, that is one aspect. Now, the confusion arises when members of the Manipur Labor Corps the 22nd Manipur Labor Corps. They were an entirely separate unit. They had no connection with the Naga Labor Corps. Only their destination and their goal was similar. Now, this Manipur Labor Corps was raised with the permission of the Maharaja of Manipur. And although the see, one thing you must keep in mind is we should not confuse the word Manipur with the ethnic group Maite. Maites are the ethnic group. And Manipur is the name of the land where different people reside. Now, the Manipur Labour Corps, the tribals of Manipur were reluctant. And Reverend William Pettigrew, he convinced the tribals to join. And at that time, the cookies, they were not willing. And that led to the first, uh, some call it, uh, the British called it the cookie rebellion. Uh, we have different names for it. So anyway, 
the Angami units of the Naga Labour Corps were diverted to the British troops to help the British tro troops suppress the cookies. So now this 22nd Manipur Labour Corps, it consisted of 750 tankus, 750 cookies, uh, let me, and 500 from the remaining tribes from the present day districts of Mao and Senapati. And these were led by interpreters. Oh, they were not led, they were accompanied by interpreters and assistant interpreters. And chief among them was uh, a Mr. Kamrai Shaiza, then Torum Singh, then Rui Chamho Rumsung, and Teba Korong. I'll, please forgive me if I get the pronunciations wrong. Uh, and uh, Thomson Nulhau. So we should not confuse the 21st Naga Labour Corps with the 22nd Manipur Labour Corps. They had no connection. They were raised from entirely different places, from, comprised of entirely different people. They had no connection with each other. Now, this, this has led to the confusion of the formation of the Naga Club. Now, the Naga Club, I have tried gathering sources from, I uh, gathering information from multiple sources. And the closest I got was that it was formed in March of 1918 by uh, Mr. Richale Penyu, along with others working in the then DC office at Kolima. And Mr. Mr. Penny, uh, Penny, yeah, I think he was the first president, secretary, and treasurer because there were not many members. Now, on May of the same year, 1918, when the Naga Labour Corps returned to Nagaland, they, not all of them, but some of them, for uh, joined the Naga Club and thereby strengthened it. So we should not have any confusion about those who join the Labour Corps and those who form the Naga Club. Now, the reason why these two events are so important of the memorandum to the Simon Commission in 1929. Now, these were signed by some members of the Naga Club. Now, I don't see what the confusion is because the wording is very clear. I, I'm, I forgot to bring the print out, but I will read from uh, my file from my, my phone. Please bear with me. Sorry, I should, uh, uh, it says we, the undersigned Nagas of the Naga Club at Kohima, who are the only persons at present who can voice for our people, have heard with great regret. See, the wording is, who are the only persons at present? So, in the day and age when it was difficult to communicate with other people, they took it upon themselves to speak for all the Naga people. Just because some of our tribesmen do not have their names or the signatures there, does not mean they're excluded. They are saying clearly that they are speaking since they are the ones present. Now, they had multiple reasons for their fears of being The one of the issues was taxation. It says our country is poor 
and he does not pay for his administration. Therefore, if it is continued to be placed under the reform scheme, we are afraid that new and heavy taxes will have to be imposed on us. So the fear of taxation was one of the driving factors. And uh, the second was the fear of encroachment from other people who are more advanced than us. So please do not make this, this memorandum a point where we exclude some people or some people try to uh, claim greater rights because of this. So that is another aspect, uh, aspect to that. Now, uh, if you have anything, uh, questions, uh, I'll be willing to answer them later on. But since there are a lot of threads here, many stories, I would like to advance as fast as possible. Now, coming to the NNC. Now, the NNC, in its first resolution, passed on 19 June 1946, it does not talk about independence. It, there were four points there. The first point was solidarity of the Naga tribes, including those in un unadministered areas, so which were not properly ruled by the British. The second was, it was at that time that Assam was brought under the administration of Bengal. So the NNC objected to that. The third point was autonomy. Autonomy, sorry, within Assam. Please keep this in mind. Within Assam, which safeguards for the interests of Nagaland. This is the first time that the term Nagaland was used. There were no defined borders, but when they used the term Nagaland, they meant Naga inhabited areas. And the fourth point was separate electorate for the Nagas. So the story develops. I am not saying that anyone has established a right to independence or anyone has sold a right to independence. What I'm just narrating is the story. The sequence of events that happened. I am not claiming anything, nor am I denying anything. Please keep that in mind. I'm just taking the facts. If you have counter facts, you can pick it up later. Now, in 1947, the nine point agreements, the, uh, the Akbar Hyderi agreement, there, among others, this has been the precursor of successive agreements including the 16 point, 16 point agreement and the basis for the foundation of the state of Nagaland. Now in the nine point agreement, point number three states, no laws will affect the terms of the agreement or the religious practices of the Nagas without the consent of the NNC. So one of the fears of the Nagas was that we would be converted to Hinduism. So this was addressed. And point number four brings up the same. The terms of the agreement or the land will not be affected without the consent of the NNC. The wording, I believe that Article 371A has uh, taken, uh, uh, springs up from this because without the consent of the Nagaland Assembly, nothing can be passed. No central laws can be passed with regard to Nagaland. Now, Point number six, two states that all Naga areas should be brought under one administrative unit. So this thread of integration of Naga inhabited areas carries on. Now the problem was in point number nine. It says that there would be a review within 10 years. Now the problem arose when the Indian authorities claim that after where, 10 years, the review will be under the constitution and laws of India. Whereas the NNC claimed that it will be a totally new agreement and it does not necessarily have to be under the 
the state of, uh, I mean, the, under the constitution of India. So that is another aspect. Then in 1947, Mr. Ezeb Pizzo, he declared independence. He raised the flag uh, on 14 August. We all know the story. But uh, I think one, one thing we should know is that he did not raise the flag as the president of the NNC. Because at that point in time, the president of the NNC was Mr. Uh, Mondomo Titan. He was the president after 1948. Now, it was only in 1951 that Mr. Fizo became the president of the NNC. Now, after his uh, taking over as the president of the NNC, he held the plebiscite. Now, the plebiscite of 1951, see, we, are, we have to understand that uh, this is not a modern day and age where you could travel anywhere you wanted, where you could call up anyone. There were no roads, you had to walk on foot. So people were sent and they could not cover every Naga tribe, every Naga area. But they approached the elders of the villages, of the tribes, and they gave the consent. Now, this practice is still prevalent in Nagaland. The chiefs, the elders, the council, they decide on behalf of the village. It is not a democratic practice, but this has been the tradition. Now, we may change it in the future, but what has happened in the past has happened. So you cannot say that this plebiscite was a thing mm, not proper. It was proper for the day and age. So that is one aspect to that. And, mm, then Mr. Fizo, this is where the first rift among members of the NNC happened. Now Mr. Fizo called for all government employees to resign from government service. Now, this created a wedge between those serving in the government offices and those who are not. And uh, as is usually the case, the more educated were already in service. So it became a sort of a divide between the educated and the uneducated. And this call from all records uh, that I've been able to access was answered only by two persons. Only two persons resigned from government service. One was uh, Mr. Meritang, who was a compounder in the Assam Rifles. A compounder is a pharmacist, okay, uh, dispenses medicine. And the second was uh, Mr. Chaknang. He was a carpenter instructor. So these two persons were the only ones who resigned from government employment. Now, um, going forward, the war, see, there are parallel threats to the story. Now, this, the NNC was the organization. Now, at this stage of time, the Assam police and as some border guards they were called. They were already uh, committing atrocities upon the Nagas. So while this, all this was going on, on the other hand, this conflict had started. Now, the members of the NNC, they realized that they needed a government. Because NNC as an organization was not capable of handling the day-to-day -day affairs, uh, handling the thing. So in March, 22nd March, 1956, uh, the declaration of the federal government of Nagaland at, uh, at Pensinu village. So there, that was the first time that a Naga government was formed. So please keep that in mind. The NNC was the first Naga organization and the FGN, was the first Naga government. So now, with the declaration of the federal government of Nagaland, then uh, 
in June of 1956, the same year, 22nd March, it was declared, the government declared, and in June, the FJN ha held its biggest ever session at uh, Sunny's village, Waka. And uh, Mr. Skatosu was uh, elected the president. But unfortunately, he had not reached the stipulated 45 years of age. Uh, the constitution of the NSCFGN stated that the president had to have reached a completed 45 years of age. So an electoral college was uh, formed and they selected Mr. Krisenisa as president. He was the first president of the yeah, FGN. Why? But in October of 1959, Mr. Sietsu uh, resigned, and then Mr. Skatosu was elected in his, uh, in his place at Iranuni. Now, this is one thread of the story. The other thread is the war. Now, people, uh, the younger, especially the younger generation, even I never witnessed that war because I was still, uh, it was before I was born and towards the tail end, I was just a, a toddler. But there was a war going on. It was not an insurgency, it was not a rebellion, it was a proper war between the Naga army and Indian army. Now, uh, Mr. Fizo had set up the Naga home guard under General Tundi and uh, Mr. Kaito, the later on General General Tundi, General Kaito had set up the uh, Naga safeguards, yes. So when the FGN was formed, it was combined and that gave birth. The combination of the Home Guard and the Naga safeguard gave birth to the first Naga army. And the commander in chief was General Kaito. So, this war, the first real battle between the Indian army and the Naga army, took place in mid August 1955. It started mid August 1955, and there was Koshepur, uh, Kaitia village, Sataka area. So, the headquarters of uh, the army was there, Naga army. And then the Indian army attacked them. Now, see, I'm reading the stories because there is a purpose to it. I want to show what drove people to do the things they did. So this war started and the Indian army and the SM rebels, they, they pincer attacked the Indian army from the north and the SM rifles from the south. Now, mid August, they started bombarding with mortars. And up to the 4th of September, there was heavy bombardment. And it's only on the 4th of September that they attacked. And from the 4th to the 10th, they fought close quarters. So, this is not an insurgent war, this is a real war between two armies. They are fighting for a sustained amount of days without a break. So this, I'm giving just a few examples. This was under the generalship of General Kaiku. Then again, uh, another instance, this too, I think all of you have heard it, that is uh, the attack on uh, the Tuda post, led by General Zihato. Now, that was fought for four days. They attacked the Indian army post at Tuda for four days. And the Indian army could not provide supplies or reinforcements to the troops there. So this, they were airlifting, uh, I mean, airdropping supplies. Then uh, they shot down the quota. That was uh, just pure blind luck. Anyway, see, these are examples of what I mean of a war. They were ambushes. There were skirmishes. All that was happening side by side. But I've just given you these two examples of what it means to have a sustained war with an army. 
So this backdrop, alongside with this war, there was the suffering of the people. Now, you cannot imagine what the people of Nagaland were going through at that time. Now, the villagers used to call it grouping, but it was herding of the villagers into concentration camps. In fact, the US Army in Vietnam, they copied the Indian system of grouping in Vietnam. Now, the purpose of grouping was to herd villages together so that they could not feed the Naga army. Now, they were herded together, they were not allowed to cultivate their fields. And in the few instances where they were allowed to cultivate their fields, they had to be packed by a certain time. And there were many, many instances uh, where uh, it seems in some instances, uh, they, they were made to bear body seals. No? The seals were put on their bodies, and women were sealed on their breasts, private parts. No? See, things like that were happening. Now, the village of Mamatong, I'm giving one example, was raided 30 times in one within one year. And it was burnt, burnt to the ground on 25th April 1956. Then again, Yampang village in Pwengsang. On April 19, 1956, 50 villagers were killed. Most of them were beheaded. And later on, in that same year, another 269 of them were killed. See, I'm just giving some examples. There were hundreds of such cases. Now, again, after the first ceasefire in 1960, Mr. Isak Chishesu, he was the Secretary of External Affairs of the uh, FGN, he wrote to the government of India and in his letter he states that hmm, 34,244 Nagas died in the period 2nd October 1952 to 1960. Out of the 34,244, 10,358 were either shot or bayoneted, stabbed with bayonets. 16,876 died in concentration camps. 7,015 died of starvation, and the rest due to unknown causes. And in that period, 36 villages were raised to the ground. There was a, there was a similar village which was burned multiple times, but that is counted as one. So this suffering, this war was going on, this suffering was going on, and then again, in the organization itself, NNC, FGN, FGN tribalism was raised, raised, raised in his head. So it is very easy in hindsight to blame people. Huh? Why did you, I, you shouldn't have done that. But when you look at the context, then you will understand why things developed the way they did. Now, the 16 point agreement. So there were those who formed the NPC, the Naga People's Convention. They were those who saw the suffering of the people and who, dis who decided to try to do something about it. And they approached the Indian authorities. And at that time, Nagaland was just a district of Assam. Now, all that they aspired for was an autonomous area. They did not even hope for a state, but they decided as ah, since uh, we are we are going to approach them, we might as well ask for something impossible. So they up their demand to a state. And they were granted that state. Now I believe it was in uh, sometime in 2000, I don't know the exact uh, year, but when Mr. Jemir wrote the bedrock of Naga society, 16 point agreement. Now, so many people were against it, but how many Nagas read it? What he has stated in that book is correct. 
I'm willing to debate with anyone. I will defend Mr. Jamir on that book. I do not agree with Mr. Jamir on many, many issues. But on that, I agree. That is the bedrock of another society. Because Nagas, as explained earlier, we never existed as a single unit. We were a desperate group of, uh, uh, not, not desperate, sorry, uh, desperate group of people, tribes. Even within the tribes, we were, we existed in different villages. We had no connection with each other. So the 16 point agreement was the agreement which first put Nagas under one administrative unit under the rule of Nagas. That is the foundation on which we are trying to build up now. That is the bedrock. That is where we will base any future society that we can build. Now the 16 point agreement, number seven of the 16 point agreement along that is also based on the nine point agreement. So these, these issues are core issues and they have not never been given up by any Naga. So there is right to the religious and social practices. Naga customary laws and procedures, uh, customary, civil and criminal laws according to Naga customary laws. Ownership and transfer of land and its resources will belong to us. Point number 13 was, see, please keep this in mind. Point number 13 says consolidation of contiguous Naga areas. Hmm. The other Naga tribes inhabiting the areas contiguous to the present Nagaland should be allowed to join Nagaland if they so desire. Now, please keep this in mind. Listen to the words carefully. They should be allowed. That means the government, of, neither the government of India nor the state governments should deny them the right to join Nagaland, but if they so desire, not by force, but by consent, by will. Now, Mr. R. C. Chitin Jamer was sent in 1962 to address the Nagas of Manipur into joining the state of Nagaland. Now, he spoke at Pukul, at a public ground, asking the Nagas of Nagaland to join Nagaland. Now, two people spoke, I don't know about the others, but two people spoke on behalf of the people of Nagaland. One, Mr. One was Mr. R. Suisa, and the other was Mr. Adhika Mao. And both of them They refused to join the state of Nagaland. So the terms of the 16 point agreement, one of the terms was, uh, it's not that we didn't fulfill it, but some Nagas refused to think, accept it. So please keep all these things in mind when you talk about any issue. All these are connected. Then uh, now again, since these were happening on different threads, on panel lines, but all are connected to the story. So again, I come back to the question of the RGN, the Revolutionary Government of Nagaland. Nobody talks about it. I don't know why. But there are accusations that the Sumis betrayed the Naga cause, the NNC, by forming the RGN. Now, those who say the Sumis betrayed the uh, NNC or the Naga cause, do you know the sequence of events that led to the formation of the RGN? Now, taking the example of uh, the Irish struggle, the Irish had an organization. Uh, an organization, the Sinfed. And they had the army, the IRA, the Irish Revolutionary Army. Now, when they were fighting with the British, the organization was sidelined and the IRA had complete authority on all matters. Because when you're fighting a war, 
when you're fighting a guerrilla war, it falls to the fighters to decide matters. Even in a conventional country during times of war, the politicians listen to the generals. So now, whether you admit it or not, whether you like it or not, the Sunnis bore the brunt of the fighting, the Sunnis bore the brunt of the sufferings. I'm not saying that Sunnis are entitled to more rights because of that, no. We did our part, everybody did his part. Some in greater measure, some in lesser measure. But we all have an equal share. But when you say Sunnis betrayed the cause, then it is for Sunnis also to claim what we did. Now, I am not here to defend Sunnis. I am just narrating a story. If it is wrong, if you find it factually incorrect, then you can correct me. So I will uh, narrate the sequence of events. Now, in 1960, the first Indo Naga ceasefire was declared. Now, in 1965, General Kaito was removed as the commanding chief. And he was made the defense, defense minister. Now that seems like an upgrade. But when you are fighting a war, when you are taken away from a battlefield, then uh, that means you are sidelined. And th that would have been OK. But it is on record that a member said that anybody can be commander in chief except Kaito. Now, that, that is not the way a government is run. So we can argue about that or later on or on, on another day, but that is how it was removed in 1965. Now, in 1960, from 1966-67, there were rounds of talk at prime ministerial level. See, uh, this is the, uh, the NSNIM when they first I signed the uh, agreement with the government of India, there was a thing, the promise of uh, talks at Prime Minister Rilam. They, they were copying what has happened in the past. It was nothing new. But the difference is that there really were talks on the Prime Minister Rilam. Mrs. Indra Gandhi was speaking directly to Mr. Kratos Kai, the Prime Minister of the FGN. Prime Minister, Prime Minister. Now there were six rounds of talks in that period. And uh, on the sixth and final round, what I heard was that during the course of the talks, Mrs. Gandhi told Mr. Kato, oh, Mr. Sky, your house is divided. Now, later on, it came to pass. See, recently there was an article and uh, I think a video by the print, the article I forgot where it came out. Anyway, they blame Mr. Muiva, but in this case, Mr. Muiva had nothing to do with it. It was Mr. Ramyo, Z. Ramyo. He was also Tanku. He was Fizo's man during the talks. He was relaying the messages to and fro, informing Mr. Fizo of what's taking place. So, Mr. Whether he instigated Fizo or not, whether Fizo did it his own accord or not, nobody knows. But the message was conveyed by Mr. Fizo to Mr. Kato that no agreement can be signed without the signature of the president of the NNC. So now when Mr. Fizo is in London, so that meant either extension of the talks or whatever it is, there was a delay because of that. Now, who currently some members walked away from the talks and their excuse was that the Hyderabad house where they were staying, they were asked to vacate Hyderabad house. Now, they took it as an insult, maybe. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a few elders I met, they said, see, it does not matter where you stay, as long as you can get what you want. So it's just an excuse. So whatever the case is, uh, 
and uh, the reason why the Nagas was the biggest height of the house was because uh, a Russian trade delegation, which had a long-standing uh, engagement to come to India, they had they were going to be put up there. That is why. Anyway, leave that aside. So the talks failed. The six rounds of talks, prime ministerial level failed. Now there are sixty-six to sixty-seven. Now. Um, on 10th April 1967, now Mr. General Kaito was a commander in chief. His elder brother, Kato, was a prime minister. And uh, Mr. Skato Su, the president, they were in laws. So it seemed uh, on the surface, it seemed as if uh, one family was controlling the FGN. And again, other times we would see as the Sunnis controlling the FGN. But when you talk about that, what exactly were they doing? There was a war going on. They were fighting the war. There were talks going on. They were doing what they had to do. So this is subjective. What I am giving the facts as they stood there. Now, 10th April 1967, Mr. Scott Su was removed from the uh, presidentship uh, of the FGN because of one reason. Now, all along, they had been fighting with the Indian Army without the budget, without the, uh, without the uh, uh, defense budget. Now, suddenly, a defense budget of 25 lakh rupees was put up. Now, Mr. Skato, his contention is that when Nagas are so poor, when they can hardly pay house tax of 5 rupees, how do we expect to raise 25 lakhs? So he did not give presidential assent to the bill. Now, according to the constitution, if the president does not assent or does not reject the bill within 90 days, then the bill automatically passes. So, Mr. Scouto's uh, non-assent was just a symbolic gesture on his part. The bill would have been passed, but they used it as an excuse to impeach Mr. Scouto. And the impeachment procedure also was very easy. It should have been a two-thirds majority but none of them happened. Anyway, I'm just stating facts. Now, that is 1967. Now, 1968, 26 May 1968, Mr. Kato Sky, who was the Prime Minister, was removed, stating that they wanted to change, the FGN wanted to change the form of government from a prime ministerial to a presidential form of government. Now, along with that, what people do not know is Mr. Kato was already fighting with his younger brother, General Kaito. Because General Kaito had seen all his maneuverings against them to depose them. So he wanted to form an army government. But his elder brother, Kato, refused, saying that if we form an army government, that means we will have to control people by force. And he didn't. So while that was going on, again, the ho ho tatar ho ho said that they would change the system of government. Therefore, Mr. Kato would have to step down. Now he stepped on. After six months, again they reverted back to the prime ministerial system of government. So, if you were in his place, what would you think? Was it a genuine wish to change the system of government, or was it an excuse to remove him from office? So, these are the reasons why the Sinhis felt betrayed. 
There was a systematic, they seem to be a systematic, whether it's there or not, that is for everyone to make his own judgment. But there seem to be a systematic movement to remove Sunnis from the positions of power they were holding. Now, despite all that, Mr. Uh, sorry, General Kaito, he formed the army government in 1967. But since his brother did not consent to it, nobody joined General Kaito. Apart from a few, of course, a few people who were his followers followed him, but nobody of importance. Then he was assassinated. After that, there was again under controversy arose. Some who wanted to break the ceasefire and some who wanted to continue the ceasefire. Now the very uh, odd thing was those who were, did the most of the fighting wanted to continue the ceasefire, whereas those who did the less part, they wanted to break the ceasefire and fight. So that led to the formation of the revolutionary government of Nagaland. All these events combined. The fact that there was a systematic uh, targeting, removal of semis from offices of power, combined with the fact that Sumis were born the brunt of the fighting, was searching for a way out, whereas others wanted to start the fight again. So they formed the Argent. Now, what did the Argent do? Did they make a deal with the government of India? No. If you know of any such, please tell me. They continued this ceasefire. The Argent continued this ceasefire up to 1973, I believe. Yes, 73 was the year where they surrendered. They surrendered. And those who wanted to join the BSF joined. The vast majority of them didn't join. They just went back to the thing. Prior lives. There may have been one or two uh, people in positions of power in the RGN who might have taken advantage. But there was no formal agreement, no formal package, nothing of that sort. The only demand was for the creation of four new districts. Up to that instant of time, Nagaland had only three districts, Kohima, Mogokchung, and Kwensang. And it was the RGN, the RGN's condition. The only condition they had was to create the districts of Mon, Pek, Waka, and Zinabuto. And that is the end of the Arjan story. They did not tax people. They did not claim to bring something better for the Navas. They were the element which felt betrayed by the NNC. The NNC may think that the Arjan betrayed them, but the Arjan also felt that the NC, uh, NNC had betrayed them, so they walked out. Uh, they surrendered, finished. That's the end of the story. No, no need to point fingers. The facts are there. Mm. Now, coming to the NNC, now, the funny thing is, these people who have been denouncing all the previous accords, who are all for war, they signed the Shillong Accord, and the Shillong Accord, just one, the first point is that to accept without condition the constitution of India. That is, that tells the story for itself, I will not elaborate. Ah. No need to go into why they signed, who signed it, what were the terms of uh, the thing, accord. Point number one. Then, uh, Muiwa and Isa, they condemned the Shillong Accord. Then, again, another part of the story is uh, in 1979, Isa and Muiwa, they were surrounded. That's while they were in Burma. First world Burma, uh, present day Myanmar. They were surrounded and, uh, I mean, not surrounded, they were arrested. And they were about to be taken killed. But uh, those who wanted to execute them needed an order from 
General Kole Konyak. And General Kole Konyak refused to sign your order for their execution. In that period, Kablang came, Mr. Kablang came, he surrounded the camp and said that if Isak and Weaver are harmed, he would kill everyone in the camp. And that stalemate hmm, carried on for three days. At the end, uh, Isak and Weaver, he was spared. And that's just a side story of uh, the differences between the NNC. Now, in 1980, uh, we all know uh, that the NSN was formed. Now, formation of the N NSN was done by hmm, Isak, Mulba, and Kole. Ah, sorry, Kapla. Hmm? Now, what all of us are wondering is about the split. The split in the NSN. Now, depending on who you listen to, you have different sources. I've also heard many different differing stories from different sources. But from what I gather, the most, the closest to the truth I got was that Mr. Muiba was going to China. They call it the Ali Kaman, the Forum Kaman. Then uh, while crossing the Kachin ter territories, uh, some misunderstanding cropped up between the Kachins and Mr. Muiba, and the Kachins refused him passage. And they sent word to the NSCN saying that in future, only Isa and Kablang will be allowed to pass uh, Kachin areas, not Muiba. So Isa was sent in his place. Now, during the absence of Isa, there were two factions broke out. I mean, uh, two parties emerged within the NSN. One was for talks with India, the other was against it. Now, I believe uh, that Mr. Niva was the one who started this, the talks with India. He wanted talks with India. And while this was going on, the killing started. Now, it might have end started as uh, a factional feud, but it ended up as a tribal one. Because the people of Myanmar, the Nagas of Myanmar, they used to carry the loads of the NSCN, they used to do all their works, uh, menial labor, everything. But uh, see, it means don't think that I am being drastic. Uh, or I have a, a certain hatred for any certain tribe. But this is not something I invented. This is what I've heard. This is what I have been able to confirm so far. The Tankuls used to really mistreat the villages of Myanmar. They used to beat them. They used to uh, mock at them for the ignorance beat them when they couldn't carry loads. So maybe the villagers saw this opportunity, this factional feud as the opportunity for revenge and they chased out all the temples. So if this version is right, there was never a split in the NSN. It was just one tribe was driven. Anyway, I leave that. I am not giving any judgments. I leave that to your own judgment. You form your own opinion. Now, coming back to Isab, what was Isab doing at this period of time? He was not there. So now, uh, people uh, have given me various uh, thing, tags that I'm, I support this or that. or So, uh, Mr. Kitovi, uh, I know him by reputation. His wife is related to me also from the same village, my village of origin, but I have never met him. Whether you believe it or not, uh, but that's what I'm stating. Uh, and if you can prove that I have met him, then you may bring that proof and shame me in public. Anyway, yesterday I went to meet him. I wanted to ask him, what was what were you doing what did Isak do at this period of time? Because he, after Isak, he was the senior most among the Sunnis. Now, whether you like it or not, 
whether you like it or not, the Naga army is still run on tribal lines. Okay, we may talk about nationalism, but our tribe is paramount. There are few from every tribe who believe in the national idea, who fight for the national idea. But the vast majority, we still hold on to our tribal loyalties, still hold on to our village loyalties. So I wanted to know from Kitori what happened. So according to his thing, Isaac had gone to China, was on the way to China, when this uh, misunderstanding cropped up. So he sent word to Isaac saying, please come back. Things are not going well. Then what, what, uh, what he uh, the reply he got it seems was that we stopped to him. Just hold on. Ah, it is a very important mission. I cannot come back, but stick with the majority. So he told me he followed the majority. Now I asked him then. What happened when Isaac came back? Then Isaac came back, never said anything, and then went to India via Anoja. And they have no, no formal contact, I mean, uh, personal contact since then. So that is another version of what, uh, not another version, that is what the only thing I've heard about what Isaac did after this uh, thing. The action split okay, of 1980. Now, be that as male, that is, this is just, I'm just giving the background. What I want to discuss is the contemporary happenings now. Now, the NSC and IM, they are a relatively new outfit. Now, how did they gain prominence? How did they gain power in Nagaland? Very simple. They managed to fool the elders of Nagaland with false Christian principles, talking about Nagaland for Christ, Christianity, on the one hand, on the other hand, no tolerance, killing anyone which who even speaks out against them. And they managed at the same time, while they were fooling the elders with Christianity, they were terrorizing the young people. This too, the brunt of this too has been felt by the Simis. In the 90s, early 90s, 80s and 90s. Oh, not the 80s, early 90s. You ask the those above 50 in Znaboto what the IM is to do. Leaving aside the question of being able to bring, you're not allowed to play cards. If you were caught playing cards, you were made to eat the cards and they would beat you up. You were not allowed to play carom. Carom, you were beaten up. That was one of the tactics. They terrorized people into submission. Here in Dimabo, they took up selective killing of semi, uh, you can call them local heroes, dadas. I personally know of two people. I consider them all day, they were slightly elder to me. They were my friends. They were killed. Not for anything, but just because they happened to be local heroes. Just to prove their dominance. And the other was the capturing of organizations, the Naga Ho Ho, the NSF, and they, they set up the NDMHR. And the ultimate was the subversion of the state government. They first tried it in 1998 in the elections. They said that uh, we will bring a solution. So boycott elections. Now, I don't know what brains uh, the Naga politicians, the opposition had, 
but uh, Mr. Jammer refused. And Mr. Jammer, it seems uh, he said that I have taken an oath on the Bible to follow the Constitution of India. So I cannot think for sure in myself. And uh, that is how the Congress uh, had a thing, a landslide victory. There was no nothing fishy about that. The IM tried to get everyone to boycott elections. The Congress refused to boycott. That's why the Congress, uh, since they filed, they won. Now in 2003, this is where the real tamasha begins. 2003, Rio came. On the one hand, the IM lambasted Mr. Jammer for writing the uh, bedrock of Lagos society. On the other hand, Mr. Rio jumped into the IM uh, bandwagon, promising a solution within three months. And uh, here we are. 2003, uh, I'm not sure, we are 27 years, no? I believe. 27 years down the line, what have we achieved? Oh, sorry, we leave 27 hours here. Yeah. Anyway, whatever it is. Now, all along, we have been made promises of impending solutions. We have been praying for a solution. I have written multiple times to the newspapers, they published some of them. I said, what solution are you praying for? Do you know what solution they're going to bring? In the framework agreement, everybody has a something fantastic had been achieved. Then the UNPO, I, at first when I heard the UNPO, I thought it was some organ of the United Nations. It's just an NGO, a non-governmental organization. Anyone can be a member of the UNPO. It's not the exclusive preserve the, of the NSNIM. So all this, we have been lied to, lied to, lied to. And now again, why is every Naga talking about sovereignty? The word sovereignty never existed in the Naga freedom struggle until the IM. All Nagas knew was independence. Independence, independence, independence. That is the only word that Nagas knew. Sovereignty is a newly coined term. Now we come to the question of, uh, I mean, uh, shared sovereignty. What does it even mean? Uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, Mr. K. Say, uh, Kohima Gas Agency say, he sent me a WhatsApp message the day yesterday saying that there's only one nation which shares sovereignty with, I think, New Zealand or Australia. Okay, anyway, it is the island of New. And it was independent. And it chose to share its sovereignty with. Uh, please let me check once, okay? Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, New Zealand. So this island was independent and it chose to share its sovereignty with New Zealand. See, that is the concept of shared sovereignty. When you have sovereignty, when I had it, then I can choose to share or I can choose to share. A person who does not have sovereignty cannot choose to share his sovereignty with anyone. So, I have explained also the concept. What is independence and what is sovereignty? I've, uh, it's been published in the papers, but nobody seems to bother. And uh, I'm tired of bringing up the same issue. Just uh, when I posted about this webinar yesterday, one uh, boy commented saying that uh, it's been many days since we have seen any article of yours. Now, I'm one man. And I'm writing against multiple organizations, against the government, against NGOs, against... So, but when it comes to repeating myself, all these concerns I have shared before, where is shared sovereignty? Where is framework agreement? Where is a uh, uh, solution? I think, and especially the constitution, the flag in the constitution. I've written last year. 
I said, what does a flag mean? It's nothing. It's just a symbol. Anyone can have a flag. Even my village uh, thing, student union, my village sports also they have flags. What is so great about having a flag? What matters is the constitution. Now, the IM and the supporters of the IM are talking about constitution. Now, do the members of the IM or the supporters of the IM constitution even know what the IM constitution is? You tell me. Do you know? Do you know on what principles the NSGN has been thing, formed? It has been formed on Mao Zedong's communism. Its constitution is there for anyone who has the will to search for it. Now, let me read out what the constitution states. Now, Constitution Part 2, Article 1. Part 2 deals with the council and government. And Article 1 states, one party, one government system in Nagaland. In Nagaland, there's no talk of Nagalim, okay? Nagaland. One party, one government system in Nagaland. So that means the uh, Nagas of Manipur, Assam, and Anshal, they'll be allowed to have anything. But in Nagaland, one party, one system of government. And NSN is the only authentic Naga National Council, and the GPRN is its legitimate government. So that means automatically no choice. We'll have, all have to be. We'll all have to submit to the authority of the NSN. Now, this is communist, the communist idea of democracy. You have to belong to the party to be able to participate in government. If you are not a member of the party, you are nobody. I have written about this before. I said, can you imagine, they are talking about tribal representation. representation. But even whether you are from any tribe, you will have to be a member of the NSN IM to become a member in any, uh, to be eligible for election, to be eligible for selection, to be eligible for appointment. Now, part three, it talks about the legislature and executive. Now, I have written about this also. Mr. K.K. Sema, he wrote an article saying powers of Yara world. And I waited for two days for the IAM to do, write something and I, after that, I wrote. And I explained to the people of Nagaland what it means. The Yaruwe, the chairman of the council, he has all powers. Financial, legislative, executive, judicial, appointment, everything. Now, then again, infrastructure and that is Article 6. All all means of distribution, transport, and communication will be nationalized. Okay, that seems so uh, simple, no? but when you talk about the distribution and transportation, when you, you may have all the products in the world, but if I control uh, the transportation and distribution, then you're powerless. In the oil boom of the US, in the early days of the oil boom in the United States of America, how did Mr. John D. Uh, 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 Rockefeller become the richest man in the world? Not because he had the most oil, but because he controlled, he managed to talk the railways into giving him a concession. And he controlled the distribution of oil. That is why he became rich. So when you talk about controlling the distribution and the transportation of goods, that means you're essentially you're, the whole market, the whole economy is in your hands. Now, that is one part. So communication also is there. So communication also comes in. You will not even be allowed to talk hmm, on a phone or uh, via internet without their permission. 
Anyway, part B talks about religious organizations. And now here I want, uh, I'm hoping that there's some members of the NBCC who will get this message. Hmm. It's the very thing, uh, Christianity will be the state religion, but there will be no forced conversions. Okay, that is acceptable. Now what is, for me too, I'm not a religious man. I don't even care. I am a religious man, but I don't believe in organized religion. So, but for the vast majority of Navas, all churches shall function under the umbrella of the Council of Navaland Churches. Do you know what that means? And here again, you see the success in the media where the social opinion. They talk about Nagalim, Nagalim, like what on paper, everything is Nagaland, 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 Nagaland. Even the framework agreement, everything is Nagaland. What is this? Who are they fooling? Uh, I mean, not who are they fooling. Why are you being fooled? Anyway. So that essentially it means that uh, the NBCC will no longer function, hmm. and then the Council of Nagaland Churches will, uh, our Nagaland Churches will control everything. Now we have seen this uh, in the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Russia, the Communist Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church was completely under control of the state. They appointed the priests, they transferred the priests, they did what they want, and the priests had to report to them of what they. Uh, Thing. Congregation would think members of congregation would think. This is happening in China. China also uh, Christianity flushes, flourishes, but the controlled churches. And you have this underground, the real believers are driven underground. They have to worship in secret. They hunger for Bibles. So this is the Christianity they are talking about. Now, the economic system, part five. Article one, all land and forests that may be made mentioned by the government shall be nationalized. Now you mark the re manner of the wording. All land and forests that may be mentioned by the government shall be nationalized. What it may means is that anything that a government wants, it will take, it will nationalize, it will mention it. It will be made mention, means they will name it and it becomes theirs. All land and force. Article 2. There shall be a ceiling on private ownership of land as may be stipulated by law. Now, what is that ceiling going to be? They will pass a law saying that you cannot own land. In excess of 10 square feet, in excess of 100 square feet. That means all your land, the rest of the land, no matter how many thousand acres you have, all the rest belongs to them. You know what that means? The constitution, talking about the constitution. Uh, then Article 3 talks of mineral resources. All minerals shall be nationalized. That means anything found underground is theirs. Article 4. All the big rivers and lakes made mention by the government shall be nationalized. Here again, they reserve the right to take anything, any river, any lake. Article 4. Five, industries. All major means of production and industries shall be nationalized uh, till such time as deemed necessary. So they will take away all your means of production and industry for as long as they think, as long as they want. This is the constitution. Now the uh, there is a talk of the uh, competencies, uh, competency clauses. Now I am not sure of what is contained there, but I do have a copy of uh, I think 30 or 40 articles 
He's been with me for, I think, four or five years now, which I am published in the Nagaland Times. One of the clauses, number four, states that cultivation, manufacture, and sale for, for export of opium will be allowed. So essentially, Nagaland is going, going to become a drug producing state. We are going to sustain ourselves on the drug industry uh, for export. Where do you think all the heroin in India is coming from? It is coming from the legitimate uh, thing, opium fields, which the government has licensed to produce a uh, thing. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, opium uh, derivatives are heroin and uh, morphine. Morphine is for the morphine industry. Now, number 27 and 28. Here is what I want you to know. They have no, the NSN IM, they know that they do not have the support of the common people of Manipur. I have argued with the young people of Manipur for many years now. Once I asked one young man, how many times have you called a band in favor of integration? Zero times. I told him, you call buns for every small matter. A truck runs over your dog, you call for a bun. Now, just uh, info yesterday, uh, an alleged IM carter was arrested by the army. And then uh, Mao gave there was a bun. So I commented, oh, strange money police. For one IM carter, uh, you call a bun. And for integration, nothing. All he could say, although he did not verify it, that they held one relay for integration. So the IM, they know very well that the common people of now Manipur are not in favor of integration. But they have been terrorized into silence. The IM does not speak for the people of Nagas of Manipur any more than they speak for the Nagas of Nagaland. They are, they are a self-serving, self-perpetuating body. And this is evident in the Clause 27. They are demanding for Nagaland state, their solution and envisages grant of 20 member leaders and legislative councils, meaning upper house, plus two Lok Sabha members, increased from one. And it seems they are not aware that uh, Nagaland has a, a single, I mean, Already have, we have a Rajya Sabha seat, so they are going to demand for one Rajya Sabha seat. And clearly they say, Manipur Hill area delimitation to 30, 30 seats from the present 20 seats. So they, from a long time back, they had no intention of integration. Their constitution is unacceptable to anyone from any modern democratic nation in the world. Maybe North Koreans may accept it, but even China will no longer accept this. This is the constitution they want for us. This is what they plan for us. So, are you willing to fight for this? The Naga journey, we are just starting our story. Before we have started crawling, we are talking about flying. Before we have started standing up, we are tripping each other. Nagaland is the experiment. For Navas. Look at us. Shameless people, primitive people. We, the little people, the educated people, are the ones who are exploiting our less fortunate brothers. It is not India. Don't blame India. India has done more than enough to atone for its past mistakes. Right now, it is we ourselves. We are fooling ourselves, we are destroying ourselves. And we have people, educated people, who are pushing the agenda. 
We have people who are actively working to suppress our own people, to fool our own people, to mislead our people, so that we can continue to keep on exploiting them, taking away their rights, their privileges. It is very shameful on our parts. So don't talk about the solution. Don't talk about the constitution when you don't know what a constitution means. Don't talk about laws when you don't know how to follow basic laws. What is better than the constitution of India? Which constitutional Naga, which Naga constitutional expert can prepare a constitution which is better than huh, what the constitution of India offers us? No, I requested uh, Dr. Anirudin to uh, invite uh, members of uh, the Naga Hoho, NSF, uh, Naga Mothers Association, and DMHR. I wanted to have a debate. I, I don't like lecturing like this. I would very much prefer a debate. Anyway, thank you so much for your patience in listening. I hope uh, I have not been uh, confusing on, on any issue, but if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for giving us uh, 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 in-depth you know, analysis of the different aspects of the Naga movement uh, and the Naga issue. And perhaps the discussion you know, that galvanized every one of us Touching upon, you know, uh, you have uh, uh, fully, you know, uh, touched uh, upon all the contentious issues also, and then uh, the conclusion that you have uh, given out for every one of us that uh, that uh, that the Nagas are to be blamed for the present situations. Uh, that is perhaps a very big uh, take, you know, take, uh, what do you call uh, taking points from uh, our honourable speaker. Thank you very much for. You know, deep insight. Uh, you know, taking every one of us into a very deep insight of the Naga issues, which appears to be for everybody now as a simple issue uh, of you know India understanding Nagas, and then Nagas are you know you know uh, understanding the the uh, India's position also, and then we are all are uh, yearning for a kind of solution for peaceful coexistence, but. Uh, apart from that, you know, uh, beyond that, uh, we have uh, so much to learn, so much to talk about. And uh, sir, you have uh, thankfully, you know, uh, discussed all the important issues which can perhaps, you know, lead us to the, uh, to have, uh, you know, a, a better light, you know, as we move, you know, along. So uh, now uh, I would like to open up the floor for uh, Q&A session. And, uh, Right now, I have checked the chat box, and then nobody have uh, put up uh, put out the question. But uh, I would request uh, any participant, uh, you know, who like to just put forward, you know, a question uh, to be answered by or clarified by our honourable speaker, sir. Uh, uh, you can kindly unmute, you know, your microphone. Even you can use your video, uh, you know, you can turn on your video also, and then uh, kindly, you know, make a brief uh, question to our speaker. Now I open the floor for Q&A session. If you have any questions, uh, I mean, you straying away from what I've said uh, about what you think we should do, uh, please feel free to put them up. Oh, I think I've got a question from uh, my friend Mikhail. Yes. Uh, yes, ah, yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think. Can I raise out a question for you, sir? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's asking that uh, Mr. Marman and really say that uh, Nagas have every, every right to be free. Right, right, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Mikhail, uh, yeah, that, that, that is a fact. Okay. Hmm. He did say that. Uh, you can unmute your speaker, Nikhil. It is a fact that uh, Mr. Gandhi said Nagas have a happy right to be independent. In fact, uh, in my opinion, if Mr. Nehru had not been so intransigent, uh, 
there would have been a better solution. I mean, there would have been a better alternative to the war that took that took place subsequently, because uh, there were many uh, national leaders of the time. Uh, Mr. Jai Prakash Narayan also was very actively involved in the Naga peace process. But uh, Mr. Nehru also, I think his arrogance had a long, uh, great to do. His arrogance also took a very important part in the uh, escalation of the conflict between India and the Navas. Okay, any other participant, you can kindly unmute your microphone. You can just put forward your questions. And uh, sir is ever ready to, you know, take one of our questions. And that is a very, very big blessing for us. Okay, sir, as we wait mm. for uh, other participants mm. to, you know, uh, mm. take shape uh, making their mm. questions, you know, ready, I would like to just ask uh, one question from my side. Nice sir, thing. as we all are talking about, you know, this uh, mm. final accord, you know, uh, you know, demanding, you know, every mm. Naga from every part of mm. Naga society mm. or Naga areas mm. we are now, whether mm. we understand the reality or not, uh, you know, we started getting to know that, you know, uh, after the framework agreement that was mm -hmm. signed on 3rd August mm -hmm. 2015, you know, uh, yeah. we all are made to understand that, you know, uh, uh, the peace talk is moving, you know, towards the conclusion. So, sir, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to, you know, ask about that. Um, how soon should we, you know, uh, move towards, you know, signing that uh, uh, final, you know, uh, Naga Peace Accord, according to you? Because you have already discussed, you know, the mm. you have uh, mentioned about the internal, you know, uh, mm. problems that we face within the Naga society. And then now, you know, everywhere we are talking about, you know, even uh, not even not only the Nagas, but also those mm. people who are inclined for the Naga mm. cause, they are yearning for peace to return to mm. the region. So how soon uh, do you think the Naga Peace Accord, you know, should be signed by the Nagas? Uh, okay, Doctor. Uh, see, I have no idea of uh, what the seven NNPs are asking for. Huh? And in fact, uh, I may have offended them when I wrote recently saying that they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> anyway, be that as it may, the government of India has repeatedly said that, uh, see, According to what I gather, okay, I use uh, sources, some sources of information, but um, I try to reason, to rationalize, you know, to use logic. So last year, the October 21st deadline, in my opinion, it was set for the NSNIM and the six NNPGs at that time to put forward their proposals. Because all along there was talk, talk, talk. But as far as I know, the IM had never even put forth one definite demand or suggestion. So the October 31st deadline was for that. Now, uh, I, I hear that the 69 BGs, they submitted a proposal. Now, whether that was uh, the final proposal or not, I don't know. Uh, but now this September, the central government is talking about September. Now, what I believe is, uh, see, the Indians are not fools. They are way better educated than us. They have much more experience than us. And uh, see, I don't like to generalize. But... It is because of uh, the fanatics in the RSS and uh, BJP. Otherwise, Hinduism is a very good religion, very tolerant, uh, very understanding. They accommodate people. So I believe that uh, they will definitely put some proposals before the public. 
Okay. Now, whether the IM or the 79NP is signed or not, they are going to put those proposals. And then it is for us, the people. Now, the framework agreement also states, they do not, it does not state that the, the sovereignty lies with the INSA and IM. It says with the people. So, for in my opinion, the sensible thing for the Indian government will be to bring the proposals to the people who hold the power to decide. The people. If they have seen the proposals of either the IM or the and this uh, thing, seven NMPGs, uh, they should put it before the court of public opinion. We are not so stupid that we cannot decide what is in our best interest and what is against our interest. No? So it's not a question of uh, we must sign it now or we should keep on the, uh, extending it. But we are sick of the extortion. See, they are very offended when uh, our governor, Mr. Ravi, called them uh, armed gangs extortionists. But what do you call them? Do freedom fighters go around? carrying guns, not to fight with our oppressors, but to extort from us. They have become oppressors. The very definition of an armed gang means a group of people armed. When someone takes money forcibly from you, what do you call him? You call him an extortionist. So what was wrong with Mr. Ravi's uh, description? Why everybody was so upset? I am seven and NPGs, NSNP also from uh, Myanmar. They also wrote against it. Uh, usage of language, if it is. Hmm. I think one question came up, but I'm not very sure. Oh, okay, sir, uh, let me read out a question for you. Yes, uh, yes. Perhaps today's session is an eye opener. I, I, uh, it, I really mean it, and then uh, I hope that you know, like me, other participants are also richly benefited by you know our talks today by our honourable speaker. So uh, I have one more question, sir, for you, and uh, I, after that, I also want to invite one more question from a participant before we actually wind up our session. Uh, uh, I want to just after, sir, take this question forward. Uh, mm. Then I would like to just uh, you know just send out a feedback link for every one of you to kindly you know fill up the feedback link. So uh, the question is, sir, uh, what is the way forward for the Nagas? Okay, what is the way forwards for the Nagas in our pursuance to be an independent Naga nation? Whether we are to abandon this political story or to continue. So this is uh, a very, uh, very important questions for the Naga point of view, sir. Oh, okay, the way forward. What is the way forward? What is necessary for Nagas to ever become an independent nation? There is only one condition we need to fulfill. Only one condition. That is the only condition. We must understand the purpose of laws. We must understand that everybody is subject to the same laws. That is the only way we can build a nation. Because a nation is built on laws. When you do not understand the value of laws, when you keep breaking the laws, then you cannot have a nation. So first, before talking about political independence. Let us talk about do we understand and do we follow laws? Before talking about political independence, let us talk about economic independence. What do we produce? Can we feed ourselves? Forget about uh, high-end products. Uh, luxury goods, just food, can we feed ourselves? We cannot talk about utopian uh, dreams of nationhood, patriotism, when we do not have food to fill our bellies. Look at our less fortunate brothers in Myanmar. Every year, they go through cycles of starvation. Every year, without fail. Here in India, 
the weak. The only people who are deprived are those who are being deprived by us, not by the government of India. So, let us first learn to exist as a society before we can talk of a nation. You, we have to understand that the law applies to everyone, my family, my villager, my clan, my tribe. But our attitude is laws are only for other families, other villages, other clans, other tribes. It does not apply to me. If I am in power, I will break every law. So long as I can take advantage of it. This is the only way forward for us. Until that day arrives, no matter how many agreements, how many solutions we have with the government of India. If I were in a decision-making power in India, I would grant Nagas conditional independence. Five years. Okay. Rule yourself for five years. And we'll, like the thing, nine-point agreement. Rule yourself for five years and we'll discuss the issue after five years. We will go crying, begging for India to take us back. We will be willing to forego all our special statuses. So understand that. We are like spoiled brats. We are talking about running away from our parents' home when we don't have money to feed ourselves, for example. When we don't have uh, a place to sleep. So only when we understand that we are all subject to the same laws, that everybody must follow the law, then we can hope to build a society where tribalism becomes secondary, where clanism becomes secondary, where the interest of my village is subverted to the interest of the larger one. Then we can talk, then we can say that we have made some progress. Then we can see the way forward, whether we should opt for independence or whether we should opt for the present relationship in India. As long as we do not understand what laws are for, there is no, no way forward for us. I hope uh, that answers oh. my thing. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir um as I just uh, scroll down, I could see some of the few questions still uh, uh, given out by our young participants, I believe. I assume most of them are very young, I think, young, uh, you know, Nagas, and they are very concerned, you know, Nagas. So uh, I feel uh, that I will over them also. And uh, I request you to bear with us also with these few questions, few questions because uh, I think. Uh, some of the questions that our young you know, participants or our participants put forward are like, for example, uh, you know, there are many organizations that uh, came into existence already or, and then they talk about the Naga issues, stating their own views. So uh, many uh, youth are confused uh, with uh, different theories and, uh, you know, different, with different viewpoints that uh, you know, uh, many organizations are putting forward, putting out to the uh, public domain. So which theory uh, would be better for the Naga youth? And that is one by uh, JC, CC uh, Naga. What, what, which? Uh, which theory, which theory, uh, which uh, uh, narrative, okay, uh, which, which uh, theory, theory or? Yeah, a kind of theory or a viewpoint of the, hmm. you know, uh, many, uh, organizations or Naga issues, which theory wow. or viewpoints could be the better one to be picked up? Uh, which points to be picked up? I, I don't get the question actually. Uh, actually, uh, the question is that there are many organizations on Naga yes. issues, you know. Yes, uh, yes, these organizations yes. are stating their own views about the Naga issues. Uh, so, yes, yes. Uh, uh, which issue young, you know, youth, uh, youth of today in Naga society should be hmm. picking up? Okay, okay. So, see, when you are faced with multiple choices, multiple avenues, then you have to use your reasoning. You have to use your education. Now, as I said before, we have to understand the rule of law. Any society 
whether it is a liberal, progressive, repressive, dictatorial society, every society is based on law, laws. Now, we Nagas are a primitive people. Keep that in mind. We have lived in villages. We have just entered the modern world in one or two generations. So our loyalties, our ethics, our morals are only connected, uh, are only connected with our villages. So within our village, we are very disciplined, very obedient, very law abiding. But once we move out from the villages, once we come into contact with other people, we break laws, carry on immoral lives, unethical lives, as long as we can get away with it. Because we feel that our obligation is only towards our fellow villagers, or maybe to our clan, or maybe to our tribe. Look at what is happening in Nagaland. This is the classic case of Nagas gone wrong. Look at all our educated Nagas, all the IS officers, IPS officers, uh, NPS officers, NCS officers. Look at our ingenious doctors. All of them are breaking the law. What sort of society do you hope to build? What sort of nation do you aspire for? When you're educated, when those in power are breaking the laws, the very laws which put them in the seats of power. So, I always say, let more organizations come up. Let multiple organizations come up. Until we learn to select what is good and what is bad. Because you may bemoan the fact that there are thousands of organizations in Nagaland, but until one of them functions properly, people will never be able to decide which is the best one, which is good, which is bad. Let there be ma multiple political parties. There's no one way out. Because the only way out, only right theory, only right organization, only right uh, political party will be the one which is honest, which follows the loop law which follows rules and so far there's no such organization whether overground or underground so what can we do about it there's no choice for you i really pity you pity young people you have been left without any thing role models you have to understand that there's a difference between personal achievement and contribution to society nagas have many Distinguished, uh, uh, distinguished people who have achieved personal distinction. But we have hardly any who have ever contributed to Naga society. There's a difference. Just because one person becomes an IS or an IPS officer, it doesn't mean he contributes to society. It is when he uses his office to help the poor, the unfortunate, to those seeking justice, then only is he contributing to society. Obviously, it's just an employee. It's just like any chokidar peon earning his pay. So there's no choice. Don't follow anyone. Many people come to visit me. I said, don't believe Navas. Don't even believe me, I tell you. Don't believe me also. You reserve your judgment. But we are so impatient that we follow anyone, we jump on every bandwagon. So have patience. What Nagas must learn is the patience to observe things and then to make judgments and follow people or organizations. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. I think. Uh... Once again, I learned another point from you that uh, this session is really a self-examination as a Naga uh, session, and it is really enriching. Uh, before we end our, you know, uh, session by giving you to give a very few concluding uh, 
uh, lines, you know, words from you. Uh, along uh, along with that, uh, can you just take these uh, two questions from? I think I believe these are these questions are from the students. I believe that uh, you know um, what is the extent of the book, the significance of the book Naga Saga, you know, written by uh, KK Iralu. Uh, you know, uh, when we no, talk so much. I have not read that. Oh, okay then okay then uh, what about uh, from your side one or two books that uh, naga young nagas must read about to know about the naga story better see i cannot suggest any one such book because all books have their perspective different perspectives so my suggestion is you read as many of them as possible and don't form your opinion based on only one Read as many as you can, try to get all of them into context, into sequence, and then form your judgments. I cannot recommend any single book. I'm so sorry, but that is all I have to say. I mean, that's all I can say about reading books. And one thing is, uh, listen to your elders, but don't believe everything they say. Because uh, we have a tendency to puff up our own achievements and to denigrate the achievements of others. So read as many of them, uh, many Naga books as you can and uh, uh, be patient, read them, understand them and then form adjustments. So I think uh, with that I'll conclude or are there any more questions? Dr. Aniruddha, anything? It seems uh, Dr. Rimne Longme uh, is hmm. having some uh, internet issue. No, OK. Uh, so, uh, so let us uh, conclude this program, sir. Okay, so uh, and, uh, on behalf of uh, Etso College, on behalf of uh, Department of Political Science, on behalf of uh, my colleague and the moderator and facilitator of this program, Professor Ringma Longme, mm -hmm. I thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you so thank much, Dr. Uh, uh, and then thank you all the viewers for taking time out, for being patient and listening to what I have to say. I hope that we all, or we all benefit from this session and may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.